I'm actually the next speaker, so I'll introduce myself. I'm John Allen, I'm at Cornell, and uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, Richter's syndrome, uh, an update uh, and an overview as well. So here's the agenda that we'll go over. We'll go over the historical perspective, uh, Richter's transformation, the definition and characterization of this as a pathological entity, uh, the risk factors of transformation uh, from CLL to uh, Richter's, the biology behind that, management and outcomes that we're currently using and how patients are currently doing, uh, Richter's syndrome in the era of our novel agents and what is some of the data there, and then new directions to try to help this unmet need. So historical perspective, uh, you can never give a Richter's talk in New York City without understanding that Dr. Richter was a, a citizen of our good city. Uh, he was a uh, professor of pathology and uh, was in command of the pathology uh, departments at Columbia and NYU. And in 1928, essentially published the first uh, kind of uh, and hypothesized for the first time that uh, two malignancies, two uh, hematologic malignancies in the same patient could potentially be uh, arising from each other. And you can see uh, these sheets of large atypical cells admixed with these, these smaller uh, CLL-like cells. And so the term really should be restricted to, to CLL uh, when it transforms. Uh, there are obviously follicular lymphoma that transforms, marginal zone lymphomas that transform. Uh, but CLL, when it transforms, does seem to have a true distinct biological uh, difference in, in terms of its response rates to induction chemotherapy. And, and so uh, when, you, when we use that term, we really should restrict it to the CLL transformations. So it's important to note that 90% of them are classic uh, DLBCL transformations uh, to a diffuse large B-cell uh, lymphoma uh, phenotype, as well as it's more commonly seen in, in males, almost a two, two and a half to three to one uh, ratio. They, these, when they transform, they, they typically lose the classic CLL immunophenotype. You may think that they're all going to express CD5 and CD23, but the, the third of them actually are CD, retain CD5 uh, expression, and even less uh, numbers of them uh, retain the CD23 expression. When you look at and compare CLL um, uh, at diagnosis or their CLL compartment to that uh, DLBCL compartment, P53 staining uh, by IHC can be found in 80% of the Richter's transformation component. It's important to, to note that uh, when patients uh, CLL is expressing uh, P53, 100% of the time in the Richter's they're finding uh, P53 expression. Uh, which is a sign of, of mutated and abnormal, uh, abnormal p53 processing, uh, and uh, it's when you are when your CLL is negative for p53 at diagnosis, uh, a vast majority of these Richters actually start to uh, have this p53 staining that can be seen, and so overwhelmingly 80% of the DLBCLs that are are transformed have uh, have p53 disruption uh, seen by IHC. Uh, important to note that about 85 to 90 percent of these uh, of these transformations are of the post-germinal center uh, subtype, ABC subtype, uh, activated B cell, and uh, express these post-germinal center markers such as IRF4. And additionally, when you look at the clonality related from the underlying CLL to the Richter's transformation, that 80 percent of them are clonally related to the underlying CLL. Uh, what you can find is that uh, the vast majority of them additionally are unmutated uh, and, and uh, the vast majority that are unmutated are very commonly clonally related, whereas if you have a mutated CLL that transforms, it does seem to be about a 50-50 chance, a 50% chance that that will be clonally related. And when you do have a clonally unrelated DLBCL, four or 80% or, or so of them are, are non-clonally related when they have a mutated IGH. So uh, just continuing on, so the, the, that was the vast majority of these transformations that we actually see in the clinic, uh, but it's important to note that there is a Hodgkin variant, uh, Richter's transformation as well, that that's represents about 10 percent of these, of these, uh, of, of these uh, uh, transformations. There's two distinct variants of this Hodgkin variant transformation. Uh, 
Uh, one is the classical Hodgkin lymphoma, where you have these uh, Reed-Sternberg cells admixed with this polymorphous background CD3 uh, T cell um, uh, histiocytic infiltrate. And then you also have a Reed-Sternberg-like cell that's admixed around a uh, CLL background of CD20, and you don't have this polymorphous uh, background. And uh, essentially, um, it, 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 overall, they both respond similarly, but it, it is felt that these Reed-Sternberg-like variants uh, may, may actually have a better outcome than the true Hodgkin lymphoma variant. When you look at the clonality, it's obviously somewhat difficult to do to get Reed-Sternberg cells out of these polymorphic backgrounds and to, to really assess them genetically. Uh, but it's important to note that a lot of these Hodgkin uh, transformations are EBV positive, and it's typically, that's how you can separate whether or not it's probably going to be clonally related. So they found that the EBV positive Hodgkin transformations are typically not clonally related, which uh, relates to the fact that CLL cells are, are uh, notoriously difficult to infect with EBV. Uh, whereas the ones that are EBV negative seem to be, when they've looked at it, are the ones that are actually clonally related to the underlying CLL. So the outcome for these Hodgkin transformations is obviously better than the DLBCL uh, variant, uh, but it is a little bit, not, it's not as good as a de novo Hodgkin lymphoma. Typically, we're using the same regimens, ABVD, and, and, uh, uh, that we do in, in classical Hodgkin's lymphoma with, with good response rates, but these survivals are slightly different. Uh, so the annual incidence. So this is kind of all over the board. Uh, you'll see a lot in the literature of retrospective studies showing anywhere from 5 to 20% of patients with CLL transform in their lifetime. Uh, some of the best data that I like to, to show is actually from the Mayo Clinic where they had a, a large cohort, over a thousand patients, and why, why this cohort is good is because all of these patients kind of had their longitudinal care at the center and all came to the center and were included if they had their diagnosis within 12 months. And what they found is that as time goes on, uh, uh, go back, as time goes on, the, the Richter's transformation rate kind of peaks at about 5% or so at about 10 years. Uh, so somewhere between 1% per year, uh, um, you know, 0.5 to 1% per year. And they found that if you had treatment, uh, that that risk does start to increase. So does this select for a chemo-resistant clone, a P53 deleted patient? Uh, the, but they do find that after treatment, the risk does rise at 10 years and it pushes up to about 15% of those treated patients. When you look at the Hodgkin variant uh, Richter's transformation, obviously it's a much less common uh, uh, transformation, but the annual incidence rate uh, is about 0.5% of uh, CLL patients at about 10 years. Uh, so a so much uh, le less common entity that we see. Uh, and, and it's important to note when you look at these DLBCL transformations in this study that they found about 50% of these patients actually transformed during observation without treatment, which will bring me to some points later in the talk that we need to identify who these people are so we can uh, intervene early. So what are the risk factors for transformation? Uh, uh, CLL at diagnosis, what can you tell your patient uh, or who do you have to be concerned about? Well, clinically, there's not much really. Obviously, uh, if you have bulky disease, that has been shown to be uh, a risk factor. Your, your risk is about 10 times that of a patient who's presenting with non-bulky disease. Uh, additionally, what they found uh, and what has been repeatedly shown is that if that deletion 13Q actually seems to be protective, there's felt to be some microRNAs in this area of, of the chromosome that may uh, affect MYC regulation, and by losing those, you actually uh, cannot activate MYC and, and have, and so those are some of the hypotheses behind it. Uh, but so a deletion 13Q seems to be protective. So if you do not have a deletion 13Q at diagnosis, your risk is higher than a patient who does. When you look at common biological, this, I, I should have blown this up a little bit more, but you, uh, you can see that mutational status, if you're unmutated, a higher risk, ZAP70, uh, a higher risk, CD49D, CD38, these typical poor prognostic features for CLL in general also or are predictive of your potential uh, Richter's transformation risk. And again, uh, we talked about these uh, chromosomal abnormalities and the stereotype B cell receptor, which we'll get into a little bit later as well. Uh, 
importantly, there are some kind of polymorphic, uh, not necessarily mutations that are, have been found to increase your Richter's transformation risk, specifically one of them in CD38, so the C CLL cells that have this uh, uh, genotype uh, at the phi prime region of the gene where it has a GG instead of this CC. Uh, and any combination of having a G in that position increases your Richter's transformation risk from, from diagnosis. And you can see uh, pushing up to close to 20% or so at about six or seven years. Additionally, there are other congenital kind of polymorphism uh, uh, SNPs that have been identified, one of them in a gene called LRP4. And again, uh, this has been shown to have an increased risk of Richter's transformation uh, if you or CLL has this polymorphism. And then telomere length, uh, that it's also been shown uh, by David Rossi, who's done a lot of this work and has done a lot of these uh, previous uh, studies that I'm showing. Uh, so short telomeres in the, is a risk factor for Richter's transformation. And this is somewhat goes against some of the data that we have with POT1 mutations and some other SNPs shown in uh, telomere abnormality, uh, telomere maintenance uh, genes that actually, when they're present, prolong the telomere uh, that lead to CLL development. And so if your uh, CLL has shorter telomeres, that increases your risk. And again, you can see what it uh, looks like at about uh, uh, over five years or so starts to approach this 20% uh, rate. So what is the effect of chemotherapy on Richter's transformation? Um, there's, it's somewhat un unclear, it's somewhat debatable, I think. Uh, does FCR, does FC, do fl does fludarabine, all these pur purine nucleoside analogs increase the Richter's transformation risk? Uh, the Mayo group in, this, in that cohort study, when they looked at it and tried to do uh, multivariate analysis, it never came out. When they looked at univariate analyses, they found that combinations of the alkylator plus the nucleoside analog uh, were important in terms of increasing your risk almost threefold. Uh, but there's been some more uh, recent data, actually. This, uh, this is a study that's recently came out that's looking at secondary malignancies to frontline chemoimmunotherapy in all patients. And uh, I focused on the Richter's transformation. So they looked at secondary malignancies and then Richter's transformation specifically. And what they show is that uh, uh, basically FC seems about the same as fludarabine and uh, about bendamustine, and, and it does appear that if you start to add an anti-CD20 antibody, your risk actually starts to decrease. When it comes around to it, about 5% of patients who are getting frontline chemoimmunotherapy have a transformation in these studies. Um, and then you can see here with uh, the, the effect of rituximab-based chemoimmunotherapy that decreasing this, I get highlighting the, the ability to potentially clear out a clone uh, that could be chemoresistant using other mechanisms of cell killing. So what's important and what a lot of these studies don't look at is what, what is happening to the patients who have very high risk disease, such as 17P. And, and they don't really show that data do those patients have higher, higher risks. But what we have shown is that the patients who are getting frontline chemoimmunotherapy, such as P53 deleted patients, do have an increase inherent higher risk of transformation after, after treatment uh, than their counterparts without these high risk cytogenetic abnormalities. And then when, it, when you want to look at what is the predictors for Richter's after chemoimmunotherapy, really what comes out in a multivariate analysis is uh, a high serum TK, uh, thymidine kinase uh, at, at diagnosis, uh, um, as well as non-response to first-line therapy, so a chemo-resistant bulky disease and subsequent treatment. So not a lot of things that we can actually use to really say uh, who, who it is that's going to transform on us uh, off the bat. So we also know about stereotype B cell receptors, and Dr. Brown did a good overview of uh, earlier this morning about what is a stereotype B cell receptor, but these have been shown time and time again to increase our risk, uh, a, a patient's risk of Richter's transformation. And so what is a B, uh, stereotype B cell receptor? So it's a quasi-identical B cell receptor that can, uh, at the CDR, the complementary determining three variable regions, uh, these represent about a third of all uh, CLL patients, and this study here, uh, which was highlighted earlier in the morning, just kind of shows that if you can sequence the more and more B cell receptors we sequence, it doesn't seem like we're going to get above about this one-third of them all being stereotyped. 
Uh, and so a lot of these papers, there's about a one in one times 10 to the 12th potential combinations for, for a B cell receptor to be developed. So obviously these stereotype B cell receptors, uh, common uh, to a potential antigen, uh, provide the evidence that this stimulation, this auto stimulation in the microenvironment or even uh, autonomous signaling through these, uh, these stereotype B cell receptors can lead to CLL development as well as continued activation uh, to potential transformation. And it's important to note that they're considered stereotyped when they have a 50% amino acid uh, identity that's greater than that, 70% uh, uh, greater similarity in amino acid content of the CDR3 uh, location, and then the exact same length of the amino acids at that, at that site. So why is this important? Uh, so here we show patients who have, uh, in blue, stereotype B cell receptors. This is their Richter's transformation risk from diagnosis. Again, always at about five years, what you kind of want to focus on, because these are people we could potentially intervene on that may be being observed. And you can see it all starts to approach about uh, 15 to 20 percent at five years, which is not an insignificant potential number of patients. When you start to throw in the uh, mutational status of the antibody gene, the IGHVH, uh, you can start to see if you have stereotyped and unmutated disease, your risk starts to increase and it starts to stratify based on uh, whether you're unmutated or uh, stereotyped. But uh, if you're stereotyped and unmutated, again, at five years, it starts to even push up higher in the 30 to, to 40 percent range uh, in this five to six year range. And then when you start to combine it with the, what are known as the, what would have been identified as these high-risk uh, high V genes that are being used, such as 4-31, uh, previously discussed with, uh, by Dr. Furman, uh, you can start to see if you have a stereotype, the subset 8, V4-39, uh, your, uh, your risk at, you know, at five years starts to push up to about 80%. So while I acknowledge that these are very rare patients. I'll show you later on, uh, um, you know, potential to intervene on these people. Uh, and and, and it, it, there's a question, can some of these novel therapies with potential early treatment avoid this actual transformation? And similarly, stereotype B cell receptors, when you start to combine it with one of those polymorphisms that I noted before, the LRP4, very similar story that we see with the V4-39. It starts to, uh, this is V-439 stereotypes, and here is the LRP4 with a stereotype B cell receptor. So it starts to stratify, and now we're getting a little bit better and, and have a potential to maybe identify very high-risk patients. So what are the genomic events that lead to transformation? Uh, so when you compare from CLL to Richter's, the, a lot of the data that we have really comes from this paper in 2013 uh, that, that basically whole exome sequenced, I think, 40 or 50 or 60 or so uh, pairs of CLL and Richter's samples. And what they found were the major acquisition events that were occurring. And the major acquisition events that were occurring were a loss of this loci at 9P uh, that houses uh, a, a gene CDK N2A uh, and B. Additionally, these from CLL is on the right, and this is what is looking, uh, what is occurring in the Richter cell. You see a, a high acquisition of 17P deletions. You see MYC, act, uh, MYC, uh, um, MYC alterations at chromosome 8, and additionally you see trisomy 12 starting to be enriched in these as well. When you look at mutational profiling of other lymphoma genes, you can see uh, two, that's, that's two that are rather striking that enrich in Richter's uh, p53 mutations outside of the deletion, and as well as notch mutations. And you can find that a lot of the genes that are actually starting to be enriched are actual tumor suppressors, so maybe not so easily targeted. Uh, but there are a few putative oncogenes which are in red as well uh, across the board here. So when you compare uh, Richter's to CLL, it's important to note that 90% of transformations have at least one lesion in P53, notch, MYC, or CDK N2A. Notch 1 mutations in 40%, P53 in 50 to 60, uh, and so on and so forth. So notch 1 mutations increase Richter's risk. Uh, they're present in about 10% uh, diagnosis. Uh, they are re typically recurrent mutations in the pest domain that when it's mutated, they it loses this regulatory component of the, of the gene or of the protein that allows when it's cleaved uh, prolonged intracellular signaling with its complex that it forms as a transcription factor. 
And so it's found in 30, 40% of Richter's syndrome. And what's important is that when you look at the Richter's syndrome uh, with the notch mutation and compare it to its CLL, the vast majority of them uh, have have notch one mutations, uh, if not 100%, have them at clonal or subclonal levels at diagnosis. And so this is a signaling pathway that seems to be constitutively activated and uh, is leading to transformation potentially. And here's just the data showing patients who are notch one mutated from diagnosis start to have at a five year, again, about a 20% risk of Richter's transformation at five years, and it continues to rise over time as they start to accumulate treatment and other additional abnormalities. And then, again, you put this with a high-risk V-gene, um, such as 4-39, and you start to see at five years, again, 80% chance of Richter's. So, Again, a rare patient, but somebody that you can potentially intervene on, and we have the capabilities of identifying these people potentially at diagnosis. And so there have been some other things since 2013 that have been uh, put out there in abstract form, but not much really in terms of function, but, but some other association. One is in a protein called PRMT5, which has uh, epigenetic implications. Uh, as well as a loss of NFAT2. Um, uh, so basically, um, by losing NFAT2, BCR signaling kind of basically it starts to turn on, is what the, this uh, abstract noted. And the, the mechanisms of transformation remain less elucidated. So the predictors of outcome to therapy, clonality and Richter score. Uh, in 2006, MD Anderson uh, did a multivariate analysis. They came up with this Richter score that was able to put these five components into it uh, at diagnosis of Richter's to predict how you're going to do to chemotherapy. And again, you can stratify patients uh, based on uh, how many risk factors they have. We, we have more uh, uh, newer, maybe even easier potential uh, uh, score. This is what's being termed as the Rossi score. Uh, looking at your ECOG performance status uh, and puts you in high, uh, or low, intermediate, or high risk. If you have a poor performance status, you're high. If you have a P53 deletion, you become intermediate or mutation intermediate automatically. And, and this, this incorporates your post-induction uh, uh, response. So if you uh, have no P53 deletion and you respond to treatment, uh, with, with the response, then you are in a, a low risk group and these patients actually can do pretty well. Uh, uh, and so um, it's important to note uh, that, that some patients can do, do well. And here's just how clonal relationship matters. Uh, while the vast majority are clonally related that do relatively poorly, uh, there are non-clonally related transformations that behave much like a de novo DLBCL. And you may, if you can get them into remission, may not necessarily need the aggressive consolidation with transplants. And then here, just again, showing P53 deletion uh, or, or disruptions in affecting a Richter's outcome. Uh, and all these things are kind of incorporated into this score. So what are the chemoimmunotherapy regimens that work? Well, there's not many that work. Uh, we, there's been many that have been tried. You can see here um, very aggressive regimens. What's important to take away, the overall response rate, anywhere from 6 to 40%, uh, and even less in the complete remission rate, uh, so anywhere from 0 to you know, 5 or 25 or even 30% in some of these very aggressive regimens. But, that doesn't uh, correlate into uh, overall survival. As you can see, the survival is ranging in the six to 10 month range. And we can add on OCHOP. This was recently published a month or so ago. Adding ofatumumab or newer anti-CD20s doesn't seem to do much. Poor PFS still. Uh, similar overall survivals to what's been reported. And in ASH last year, why not throw our EPOC at it? We think we've got an ABC subtype. Again, uh, this is a retrospective study looking at about 60 cases treated uniformly with our EPOC. Really no true improvements compared to historical other controls. So the impact of transplant. We, if you can get into remission, which only about 10 to 15 percent of patients can get onto a transplant due to age, comorbidities, and response, if you can get into a complete remission, you seem to, you can have prolonged remissions with allogeneic transplants. Um, autos are, are an option and can provide meaningful progression-free and overall survival, uh, but it is preferred typically still, and, and I think most centers would recommend allo if you can get into a complete remission. Um, because the patients in the auto group, the vast majority of them relapse with Richter's transformation. 
So what about uh, how, how are these patients doing in the era of TKIs? So the patients who fail, um, uh, so uh, patients who are treated with ibrutinib, about 7% of them are, are transforming. Uh, and they do it early at about a year. This is Cami Maddox uh, last year published this data of ibrutinib failures. And they show that if you have Richter's as your progression or reason for failure, overall doing very poorly at about six months median. There's recent data, uh, Anthony Mato out, uh, out of Penn has, has published kind of more real uh, world experience with a lot of um, uh, uh, with a little bit more improved uh, outcomes, but similar if you fail, uh, these novel TKIs or STI signal transduction inhibitors, uh, and you have Richter's, you still do very poorly with, with you know, year median survivals. So unmet need in highest risk patients, and, and we're almost finished here. So the, the, what is the risk in chemoimmunotherapy for these high risk patients? Can we alter this? This is really the important question. So if you treat a 17P deleted patient with frontline chemoimmunotherapy, we know the Richter's transformation rate is about 10 to 23% at one to two years, at about two years. Uh, with a complex karyotype that pushes up to about a, a third of these uh, patients that can transform. Resonate 17 using ibrutinib and relapse refractory patients noted a transformation rate at about 12% using venetoclax, using some of the same studies we've already looked at, the transformation rate in these, in these patients, high risk 17P deleted relapse refractory patients is 11%. And so that is better than this. And then when you look at the small group of patients in the treatment naive cohorts uh, getting ibrutinib up front and 17P deleted, the transformation at two years looks at about 6%. So this is much better than this, and we're starting to push this down and drive this down. Uh, but the question is, how can we make this go to zero, potentially? And so the new direction. So the best way to treat Currently, the best way to treat Richter's is to prevent it. And so um, it brings a question, can we identify the highest risk patient? And can we uh, uh, come up with a treatment that can uh, treat them early and maybe even outside of potential um, uh, current guidelines? Obviously, these are trial questions, and, and, but these are the only ways that we may be able to start to impact this disease and, and just trying to prevent it from occurring. And then obviously novel agents are, are needed. Uh, we need to start targeting the, the underlying biology. Uh, here's just a few trials that have been going on that are currently registered on, on clinicaltrials.gov. Selenexor um, uh, is, a, is effective, but actually was terminated in August due to poor accrual. Uh, there was a molecule, BCL2 oligonucleotide, that actually was terminated early due to ineffectiveness. Uh, ACP196 will be updated at ASH by our following speaker, Dr. Hillman, uh, so you can tune in for that. Uh, pembrolizumab in immunotherapy, uh, Wei Ding out of Mayo Clinic had a signal last year at ASH uh, and showing responses in relapse refractory patients with Richter's transformation getting Pembro as a single agent, saw some responses, and now there are several trials adding on your, your uh, STI of, of choice. Um, and then CAR T cells, there are some of these protocols that take some of these patients as well, but it's notoriously difficult to get them onto these protocols, obviously, uh, due to the timing and the, the rapidity uh, that the disease relapses. Uh, there are chemotherapy uh, with cytarabine and asparaginases. This is at MD Anderson. It's registered. And then what's interesting here, um, uh, this is the CL2-GIVE study that's registered now using this combination in high-risk, untreated 17P-deleted patients. So will this take that 6% to maybe zero, or will it stay there? So it'll be an interesting uh, outlook to see what's happening with these patients as we go forward and we start to put everything together. And so, uh, in conclusion, picture's worth a thousand words, as Dr. Dr. Schuster said. So I just wanted to highlight the last 10 patients or so that we've seen in our clinic in the past year or so to highlight and summarize kind of uh, the talk. And so the vast majority of these patients get DLBCL form of Hodgkin variant. You can see nine out of the 10 with the one Hodgkin lymphoma variant that, uh, that we saw. V4-39, so this patient, these patients, uh, you can identify these people potentially. Uh, this patient actually uh, transformed on observation in that, you know, maybe had we found uh, the P53 and this, could we have intervened uh, potentially earlier? At diagnosis, he had no indication for, this patient had no indications for, for treatment. P53 disruptions are very common. 
across the board, even in the Hodgkin lymphoma uh, uh, patient, had a, had a P53 disruption in his CLL. Notch 1 mutations are commonly seen. MYC alterations as well as trisomy 12 and clonal relationship is, is, is extremely common and there are obviously a few patients we haven't been able to characterize. And then like, like the data has shown previously, 50% of these patients transformed on observation while, while they're uh, uh, you know, kind of monitoring without any true indication of CLL uh, uh, treatment initiation. And then again, very aggressive chemotherapy-based regimens and very similar overall survivals to what's been reported anywhere from two to 10 months. So remains an unmet need. We need to identify these patients and we need to kind of get more targeted therapies. Thank you.